रिंग कर दिया दोबारा से देख तो तेरे पास जा रहा है अच्छा तू मोबाइल में देखेगा क्या आ गया शायद आगे आ गया आ गया है ना उसी साइड एक बार तू देख तो अभी तक तो नहीं स्टार्ट हुआ हाँ? अभी तक तो नहीं स्टार्ट हुआ नहीं हो रहा है देख तू ध्यान से देख ध्यान से तू मेरे से लॉगिन है क्या तो अपने से मैं अपने से लॉगिन और मैं सर्च कर रहा हूँ आई डॉक्टर ओपी वर्मा डॉक्टर वर्मा We are going to start our proceeding in few minutes. Okay, so stay tuned. Thank you very much. आवाज गई कि नहीं सुमांसो? आ रही है। हाँ? आ रही है। ठीक है। अब तो नहीं जा रहा ना अब मैं बोल रहा हूँ तो उसके बाद बस ना जितना मैंने बोला stay tuned तक बोला है वो वहाँ तक गई ना केवल? एक बार फिर से बोलिए। बोल रहा हूँ। Hello everyone. A very good morning to all of you. Dear participants, we are going to start our proceeding, inaugural proceeding, in few minutes. So stay tuned till. Thank you very much. नहीं thank you very much के बाद तो कुछ नहीं गया ना क्योंकि मैं speaker off कर दिया उसका अपना Google Meet का. ठीक है लाइव हो गया ना मतलब हाँ तो डिले तो होगा ही ना वो तो होता होना ही होना ठीक है ना ओके तो अब अब हमें क्या करें हम यूट्यूब पे मैं भी यूट्यूब पे देखूं क्या आ रहा है मैं यूट्यूब खोलूं जो अपना लाइव लाइव है YouTube है YouTube हाँ। से आता लाइव यार मुझे समझ में नहीं आता तो वो लाइव पता नहीं क्या आ गया ये लाइव हाँ तो इसका लिंक कैसे करूं मैं जनरेट शेयर करके हाँ। पर तो इसका लिंक आ रहा होगा तो इसका लिंक कैसे करूं मैं जनरेट शेयर करके ठीक है इसका लिंक कैसे करूं मैं जनरेट शेयर करके हो गया हो गया हो गया ठीक है इसका लिंक कैसे करूं मैं जनरेट ठीक है तू आराम कर अगर कोई फंसूंगा तो मैं फोन करूंगा तो अपने पास ही रख ठीक है तू आराम से सो आराम से सो तब तक मैं ठीक है तू आराम कर अगर कोई फंसूंगा तो मैं फोन करूंगा तो अपने पास ही रख ठीक है तू आराम से सो आराम से सो तब तक मैं ठीक है तू आराम कर अगर तू फंसूंगा तो मैं फोन करूंगा तो अपने पास ही रख
हम इसी आज मार्शल के लिए ये स्टार्ट है तो चल रहा है कस्टमर ने ज्वाइन किया था वो बोले कि मैं अभी तक बोले कि मेरा जॉब का पता लग रही है
हेलो यस सर यस सर ओ इट्स ओके सर इट्स ओके नो हां यस सर सर आई एम म्यूटिंग द माय माइक्रोफोन सर फॉर वन फ्यू मिनट्स सर या शल आई शल आई नाउ स्टा गो टू प्रेजेंट और शल आई मीट समबडी आई आई लेट यू नो सर यू लेट मी नो ओके प्लीज लेट मी नो ओके I am. I am already joined. Can you see me? Hello. I can see you, sir. Okay. Fine. Very good. Okay. very good morning to start our inaugural ceremony yeah good morning uh, a very good morning sir this is dr op varma from department of ic the yeah, thank of... you sir thank you sir okay uh, can i see some uh, this thing should i have a, a sharing or something to be done not now sir not now it's uh, uh, from uh, we will start our session from 11 o'clock okay okay oh okay okay i can i can okay. see dr om prakash verma speaking now correct 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah.
Hello, everyone. Hello. Do you have participants? Yes, sir. Yeah, am I audible? Is it okay? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, no problem. Good. You are able to see me? Okay. Yeah, we have. We have yes, there. sir. Okay, good. Okay. So, hello, everyone, dear participants. Uh, we will start our session at 11 o'clock due to the busy schedule of our worthy director. Uh, we are not able to start our inaugural session. So we will start our inaugural session in uh, second half of your uh, first second session. So we will directly start our uh, first session by our very inspiring speaker as well as the guest of honor today, Professor S. Kasturi Egan, ISC Bangalore. So we will connect shortly at uh, 11 uh, 45. So I'm calling you later, sir. Thank you. Stay tuned. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello, yes, sir. Uh, should I go ahead and make the presentation? Sir, we have we have given the time of eleven o'clock, sir. Okay, okay, fine, fine, no problem, no problem. So if you I, want I, to I, take I, some break, if you want yeah, to take I, some break or something, tea, uh, tea. Yeah, so I, I, I I am uh, comfortable. I am just uh, off for some time. No problem. Okay. At eleven o'clock and uh, five minutes eleven, I'll join. Okay. Yes. Fine. Okay. 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 No problem, sir. No problem. You can join at eleven before five five minutes. Oh, no problem, sir. Yes. Okay. okay. Pretty, I'm in some meeting. I, I'm in some games and lectures. Okay. <coughs> uh, are you able to see my screen? The yes, sir. Uh, I'm able to say uh, see applications, screen, but it is not a full screen. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Where are you? I am share the screen one minute. And, uh, one. Uh -huh. Oh, you are seeing in YouTube live channel, ah? Huh? Okay. But it is saying you are presenting here already. That's what it says. Okay. You watch from there itself. Hmm. Uh, it is only 15 minutes now to 11, so you may not be able to travel within 15 minutes and reach institute. So you probably come in the afternoon and hand over the bills. Okay, we will have a word with uh, Yogeshwar and then we will talk. Okay. okay. okay.
ಹಲೋ ಅಮ್ಮ ಇಪ್ಪ ಫೋನ್ ಮಾಡೋದಮ್ಮ ನಾನು ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಕೆ ಅವರ ಬದಿ ಬರ್ತಾವ ನಾನು ಇವರಿಗೆ ಸೊಲಿಟೈ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ರೈಟ್ ರೈಟ್ ಓಕೆ
Hello everyone. We are participants. We are going to start our session. So a very good morning to all of you. A very uh, a very inspiring speaker as well as the guest of honor today, Professor Kasurigan, ISC Bangalore, is present here for the today session. Today first session. Uh, I. Hello, good morning. On the behalf of organizing team CCA 2020, Idol Topi Verma, department from IC department, welcome you all in the first session of ESTC, titled as Cryogenics and Composites Theory and Application. So when I hear the term cryogenics, the things that come to our mind is cryogenic engine. In today's scenario, world is changing so fast and everyone is talking about optimizing the performance so as per this idea i personally discussed with many people who are working in the same area especially dr Ayurma. and we have discussed after the discussion we have planned to organize this stc our team our team didn't expect such a volume such a high volume of participants register for such estc we have crossed 700 plus participants so it always encourages thanks for again all the participate participants however my experience is uh, how, uh, however uh, the experience of both the cryogenics as well as the composites uh, with the director uh, with the doctor uh, roy verma from the knowledge that gain over the years we can say the cryogenics comprise the two words Cryogenics and genics, cryo and genics, which means to produce cold. So I would like to uh, invite Dr. Ravi Verma to say some words to introduce about this subject. Okay, thank you. So, as her, thank you very much, sir. So, as I told that cryogenics come. comprises of the two words cryo and genic, which means to produce cold so cryogenics is defined as a temperature and a composite material can be defined as a combination of two or more materials i work on the cryogenics as well as on the composite so that's why this uh, i got the idea to organize a short term course on the cryogenics and composites so to uh, about it. So let us introduce the speakers of the bottom course. Hello, hello. Uh, we have collected, we have invited the hello. speakers from all the prestigious institute of the India. 
Are you able to hear me? IIC Bangalore, IIT Roorkee. Uh, we have S. Kasturiyam from IIC Bangalore, Dr. Avinash Parasar from IIT Roorkee, Professor Upendra Behra from IIC Bangalore, Professor Sushant Kumar Sahu, CSIR, Professor Gaurav Manik from IIT Roorkee, and one of the industry uh, guys we uh, have also us with us, uh, Dr. Madha Behra, Dr. Professor P.K. Maji from IIT Roorkee, Professor Durgesh Nadik from IIC Bangalore, and Professor Gaurav Gupta, uh, associate professor uh, at VIT Vellore with us. So, so now uh, we are going to start our first session. So before going to before starting our session, uh, I would like to invite, uh, I would like to introduce our today's speakers. Uh, today's speaker, Professor Sri Nivasan Kasurigan. He has started his career after completing his PhD degree from in physics from TIFR Mumbai in 1975. Okay. Sorry. So I would like to uh, invite our head of department uh, to address the audience first. Okay. Dear audience, I extend a hearty welcome to all the participants and the organizing committee. That is Dr. Ravi Verma being the convener, then Dr. Karanjan and Dr. O.P. Verma. Right. <clears throat> now, this short term course is being organized by uh, Department of Instrumentation and Control Engineering, NIT Jalandhar. Now, regarding this department, this department started in 1990 with a BTEC course in instrumentation and control engineering with just an intake of 30 students when it was known as REC. Then as the time passed, our department also grew. And in 2002, it was converted to NIT, that is National Institute of Technology. And in 2006, we all started this MTech courses. And PhD courses full time, part time, each and everything was started. And our BTEC strength, right, has grown from 30 to somewhere around 120. And we have got the faculty. Our faculty, we are having the 13 faculty members. All are from the different areas, which nearly cover, I think, all the areas where instrumentation is mostly used. Like we have got the control area, we have got the biomedical area, then sensor networks, robotics, then all other associated areas. So this committee, this uh, organizers, they have, I think, done a very good job to organize such a good course on this area of cryogenics. And one thing which I like to uh, mention that the number of participants are really huge this time. We have never experienced such kind of participants that is somewhere around 750. That is a huge participants. So I really congratulate all the organizing team for organizing such a course. And I am sure that with the passage of time, with all the lectures delivered by the experts, it will definitely enhance your knowledge and will definitely help in your professional career. I once again, again, congratulate all the organizing team. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind speech, for your kind words. So now I would like to introduce uh, our professor speaker, uh, S. Kasui Ragan. So uh, I handing over the mic to Dr. Yorma for to uh, invite, uh, to uh, introduce. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to introduce you about uh, my mentor in the PhD, Professor C. Nivasan Kasturi Ragan, sir. Sir started his career after completing his PhD degree in physics from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai in 1975. And subsequently, he joined ISC Bangalore and served as a scientist at the Center for Cryogenics Technology. He has more than 40 years of research experience in cryogenics engineering as a scientist. During his career, he has executed several R&D and consultancy projects funded by DST, that is Department of Science and Technology, CSIR, DAE, ISRO, and other known governmental agencies. His area of interest are cryogenic systems, cryocoolers, cryogenic instrumentation, gas sensors, cryo-option pump, etc. 
several student has obtained their phd and master degree by working with sir he has done more than 120 publication in national and international journals after his super annuation in 2013 he is serving as the advisor on liquid helium plant operations at physics department i see as as well as as a consultant to a, a few other institution he is involved also as a teaching faculty at the talent development center of ic second campus at uh, kudapura chalkere karnataka so let us welcome the keynote speaker of the day uh, professor kasturi oh, thank you so thank you very you much uh, thank you very much for a very nice uh, introduction about me thank you so much okay uh, now shall i go ahead and sh share my screen shall i make the presentation hello sir yes sir yes sir you can yes, start, sir. start sir okay good sir, please start the presentation sir no problem now yeah are you able to see my screens hello not now huh? not now both the phone not now sir one minute let me give a share yeah yeah i'm sharing the screen now yeah, it takes a while uh, kind now of... it is going to be visible sir yeah okay yes sir start yeah it's visible now now, so... now are you able to see the screens now sir make it full screen sir on the presentation one minute, one minute. on the presentation mode yeah yes it is okay now it's sir. okay sir you can continue sir it's okay, okay now okay now. good okay good uh good morning everybody Uh, if you permit me, I would like to remove this uh, mask which is in front of me, so that uh, you know I am actually sitting in a separate, independent room in the institute right now for this presentation. So I will be a little more audible by this. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you for calling me and asking me to make a presentation. It's a great honor to give such a presentation, which will cover so many different institutes. i'm really honored by this i'm so happy about uh, such an arrangement of a short term program which have been arranged by the faculty of your institute i'm really thankful to you for that okay now uh, the first talk what i am presenting actually i am presenting two talks the first talk what i am presenting now is something on cryogenics its fundamentals and applications okay i think uh, ravi dr ravi verma had given a introduction about me i don't know how much i deserve of that but whatever it is uh, thanks very much for his good introduction about me the plan of my talk maybe for another one hour or so you may have to bear with me it is going to be something like this first i would like to introduce what is cryogenics and i would like to talk about the historical milestones in the area of cryogenics the different cryogenic fluids which are available which can be used for various applications then i would like to talk about how does one produce these low temperatures basically there are three methods one is called the induced evaporation second one is known as joule thomson expansion and the third one an adiabatic expansion or sometimes also called isotropic expansion now either one of them or mean couple of them are used in the cryogenic plants in a suitable thermodynamic cycle so we will discuss also about the cycles which are being used in the cryogenic plants okay how does one produce still lower temperatures okay people have to go to extremely low temperature with the quest for absolute zero so how does one re reduce the temperature further down so that is will be another part what i will be talking about how the cryogenic fluids are stored well uh this we will know about the divar flask when we talk about it then we will talk also about the cryo coolers a new area which has come up in the area of cryogenics which is very similar to our you know household refrigerator where it produces the refrigeration for your application 
so also cryocoolers will produce the refri refrigeration for this specific application. Now I will touch upon a couple of applications in the area of cryogenics because this is an extensive talk, so I may not be able to spend much time on that. My talk will be concluded with a few demonstration experiments in the area of cryogenics. I'm sure most of you would have sometime or the other seen cryogenic fluids, but I feel that the demonstration experiments will be very helpful for you to understand this particular area. Okay. We will move on to the next slide. First, let me introduce what is cryogenics. Cryogenics is the science and engineering of temperatures below minus 150 degrees centigrade. Cryogenics is a combination of two Greek words, cryo and genus, which means the production of the icy cold. Cryo is icy and genus is genesis, which is the production. So production of the icy cold is the actual meaning of cryogenics. Why this temperature of minus 150 degrees centigrade had been chosen is because the gases like nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and hydrogen, and helium. In the earlier time, people thought these gases cannot be liquefied, and they called it as permanent gases. Now we know that we can liquefy these gases and the boiling point of all these gases are below this temperature of minus 150 degrees centigrade. Hence, there is a borderline between the cryogenic range and the refrigeration range at minus 150 degrees centigrade. Okay, what happens at these low temperatures? What is so special about this? such low temperatures, you see drastic change in material properties. For example, rubber, we know it is a very soft material at room temperature, but it becomes brittle like glass. There is a particular specific temperature for the transition, the glass transition temperature. So the rubber turns into a brittle material like a glass. There are also other things like metals and alloy, they become superconducting. That means the resistance drops to zero, followed by the Meissner effect. So the applications are fantastic in the area of superconductivity. We have enormous number of superconducting magnets for various applications, our MRI, NMR, and various other, say tokamax, for example, for fusion reactions and things like that. Then the biological reaction rates decrease, the rate of reaction falls drastically, and the living cells are in a state of suspended animation. <laughs> in view of this, you will be able to make use of this property for storage of food products, food material or biological components, etc. Well, now let's look at the solar system. On your right side of your screen, you see a picture of the solar system, and it starts with the sun, which is at the center, which is the surface temperature of the sun is approximately about 6,000 degrees. Okay, as you go farther out in space, you find that the temperature keeps on dropping, and the deep space is roughly about minus 200 degrees centigrade. Well, the planets in between gradually decrease in their temperatures. The Earth is in, kept in a very comfortable position, say the temperatures ranging from about um, somewhere close to, uh, say, a few degrees above zero up to about 50 degrees. So because of which the uh, life organisms can exist in Earth's surface. Of course, there are, we know that very well that there are explorations going on. People are trying to find out whether there are living organisms in other planets, etc. Okay. Now, what are the milestones of development in the area of cryogenics? 
The earliest milestone what we can see in the literature is in 1726. Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver Travels, he talks about a world in which air is okay, but almost about 150 years later, only a scientist by name Kyletet in France, he was able to produce the liquid air droplets. Now, you can see on the right side of your screen, a, the, a picture in which an instrument is seen, which is nothing but a compressor. So what he did was, he tried to compress the air into high pressures and suddenly expanded it so that he could produce the liquid air droplets. Unfortunately, he could not store the fluid with the droplets, whatever he produced by these experiments. Well, we'll move on to the next milestone. The next milestone in the area of cryogenics is by James Devar. In 1892, he developed the vacuum insulated vessel. Now, this vessel what he made was made out of glass. So you have a glass vessel, which we now know, know as Devar. It has an inner container and it has got an outer container. The interspace between the two is completely evacuated. Now you can see James Devar is making a demonstration on the screen. You can see on the picture, there is a Devar flask kept and he is uh, giving a demonstration in the Royal Institution. And this advantage of this unit was that it could reduce the evaporation rate by almost 30 times. Because of which, earlier to this invention, people were only able to liquefy the cryogenic fluids, but not able to store. But after this invention, people were not only able to liquefy, but also able to store the cryogenic fluids. Okay, we will move on to the next milestone. This is in 1895 by Cameling Onus who liquefied helium at the physical laboratory at Leiden in Netherlands. He used actually 360 liters of helium gas from the monocyte sands on the Kerala borders of India. That's what the history says. And you can see in, the, in your uh, uh, screen a picture in which Kamaling Onus is sitting and in front of him there is a glass apparatus. In fact, in the earlier times, glass was a very easy, easily malleable component for people. So all the cryostats, all the systems were fabricated out of glass. So you can see also a small bladder in which helium gas is stored. And the system what he had, had the innermost cryostat containing liquid helium, surrounded by liquid hydrogen, which is surrounded by liquid nitrogen. And outermost system was the vacuum jacket. So this was the sort of system which he had developed. This is one of the important milestones, which is very, very important for this, our uh, cryogenic area. Kamalingonas was also responsible for the development of superconductivity in 1911. Now we know superconductivity is a very important area and a lot of superconducting magnets are being developed and people are working in this area. He was the first person to show the complete absence of resistance in mercury at a temperature of 4 Kelvin. On your screen, you see a graph where the mercury superconducting transition is shown. The resistance is shown on the y-axis and the temperature is shown on the x-axis. And you could see that the resistance at around 4.2 K had dropped to less than 10 to the power minus 5 ohms. Actually, when Kamaling Wallace was doing these experiments, he felt there is something wrong with the experiment. So apparently he continued the experiment for fairly long periods of time to ensure that this is the final result. So he was actually able to confirm the 
absence of resistance in the mercury material. Okay. Now we know the superconductivity also follows, that is absence of resistance also follows the Meissner effect, which is the, the expulsion of the magnetic field or the material become perfect diamagnet. Okay. We will move on to the next milestone in the area of cryogenics. This is in 1947, in which liquefaction of helium was done by Samuel Collins in MIT, and he established the commercial production plant for helium. You can see on your screen a helium plant, one of the oldest plants. Uh, he made a couple of plants, and one of them were there in some laboratory. Actually. TAFR Mumbai had one such plant and I had the opportunity to work with this plant for some period of time in my early days in TAFR Mumbai. Well, I can go on listing the milestones like this. The lectures will be completely filled with the milestones only. I'm stopping here. The growth of cryogenic technology was mainly due to the applications. There are two applications, industrial applications and the space technological applications. Today, we have commercial liquefiers for the production of cryogenic fluids, its storage and transport containers, as well as transport devices, etc., are available. Okay. Now let's look at the temperature scale. Now you can see the temperature of minus 150 degrees centigrade. On the left side, you have a centigrade scale. On the right side, you have a Kelvin scale. And uh, you can see very clearly liquid methane, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, liquid hydrogen, liquid helium, etc. All these different cryogenic fluids have their boiling points below minus 150 degrees centigrade. Of course, people are in the verge of trying to find out what's happening at extremely low temperatures. That area is known as cryophysics and there is always a quest in trying to look for where is the absolute zero. Okay. Now, above this minus 150 degrees centigrade, that area is known as refrigeration engineering. At minus 78.5, you have the solid carbon dioxide. Then we have cryosurgery, the frozen food, which you have in your refrigerators. Then we have the freezing of water at zero degrees centigrade, room temperatures, boiling of water, and still higher and higher up in temperatures. Okay. Now, there are several cryogenic fluids. Oxygen, argon, nitrogen, air, hydrogen. These cryogenic fluids are used for a variety of applications. Of these, the nitrogen and helium are the main fluids which people always use. We'll, we'll come to that shortly. Now, on your right side of the screen, you see the properties of the various cryogenic fluids. You see the one of the column telling you about the boiling points at one atmospheric pressure. Then subsequently, you have what is called the triple point. The triple point is that particular temperature at which all the three states coexist, solid, liquid, and gas states coexist at this triple point. It is characterized by a particular temperature as well as pressure. The table gives you both the data. Next to that, you have what is called a critical point. It is also characterized by a temperature and a pressure. And the critical point is that temperature below which only liquid state of a gas exists. So in other words, if I take a gas and try to compress it, I will not be able to just produce the liquid of it unless the gas temperature is brought below its critical point. Okay, a critical temperature has a temperature as well as the um, associated with the pressure. Temperature as well as pressure is associated with the critical point. The last column on the screen tells you something called maximum inversion temperature. Now, we will discuss about this later when we talk about the joule thompson expansion. Please remember that the maximum inversion temperature is that temperature below which the joule thompson expansion of a gas produces cooling. 
Okay. Now there are a lot of application areas. I will specifically talk about the applications for liquid hydrogen, liquid helium, hydrogen and oxygen right now here. We will at a later point, we'll also discuss in about the applications of cryogenics. Nitrogen is available plenty in atmosphere. We know about 78.5% of the atmosphere or 78%, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, 78.5% uh, is uh, the entire thing is nitrogen. Okay, the remaining is oxygen plus various other gases. Well, nitrogen, since being available plenty, it's also inert. It's used for a lot of applications like aerospace, defense applications, research and development, biological applications, industrial applications. Okay, what about helium? Helium is available only six parts in a million in the atmosphere. Now, helium is actually a very strategic fluid. Liquid helium is useful for research and development for very low temperatures, 4 Kelvin, maybe even lower. Then cooling of superconducting magnets, cooling of infrared detectors, cryopump applications. And also, for example, we now know there are fusion energy systems which are being done world over. That requires also large quantities of liquid helium. What about hydrogen and oxygen? Liquid hydrogen and oxygen, liquid oxygen, serve as fuel and oxidizer in space applications. For example, we know that there are cryogenic engine systems which are being done by ISRO, so which uses liquid hydrogen as a fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. Oxygen also has various other uses breathing okay and then also welding etc oxygen and uh, likewise there are various other uh, gases which for which there are number of applications we won't discuss of that here okay we should now know how does we produce this low temperatures how does one produce the low temperatures now before we go to that state of how does we produce the low temperature, we let us look at the states of matter. We know matter exists in three states, which is called the solid, liquid. Now, kinetic theory of gases describes the gas state at high temperatures. And we know from the kinetic theory, one can derive what is called the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law states the product of pressure into volume is equal to the pressure is denoted by P and volume denoted by V. This product is equal to NRT where N represents the number of moles, R represents the universal gas constant and T represents the absolute temperatures. Okay. Now let's try to plot the ideal gas. And you can see on the topmost corner of your screen, right corner of your screen, a plot of pressure versus volume. Okay. The, uh, they are plotted actually for different temperatures. The high temperature ones are the farther away from the axis, X and Y. And as you keep on, you know, reducing the temperatures, you get multiple sub curves. These curves are now tending close to the axis. Okay, now the ideal gas does not have a liquefaction. Why? Because ideal gas is nothing but point masses. Okay, there is no volume for the gas molecules. Secondly, there is no interaction energy between the molecules. Because of this, ideal gas does not liquefy. So, if the pressure is kept constant, volume will go to zero at absolute temperature, when zero temperature goes to zero. And similarly, if the volume is kept constant, pressure will tend to zero when temperature goes to zero. Okay. So then what about real gases? Now the real gases have a completely different situation. The molecules of real gases have a finite volume. Also, when the molecules come close to each other, 
there is going to be an interaction between the molecules or there is a finite interaction energy between the molecules. Okay. The real gases at very high temperatures behave similar to that of an ideal gas. So you can see the next graph what is plotted is for real gases. Here you have a plot of pressure versus volume. So let's start with the real gas at very high temperature and gradually reduce its temperature. As you keep on reducing the temperature, you find that there is a point at which the shape of the curve changes. There's an inflection point. This particular point is what is known as the critical point. Okay. Now, if you reduce the temperature further down, you you will have the curves which are there in the saturation zone. So let's start with a gas at a much lower temperature than the critical temperature and we start compressing it. Now you cannot call it anymore as a gas, you have to call it as a vapor. Now when you start compressing the gas at particular point, I think the point is now B from A it has come to B, at B the gas starts liquefying, in other words first liquid droplets are formed. As you keep compressing the gas, more and more of the gas becomes a liquid. Okay, pressure does not change. Pressure remains constant because it's just going to be only the vapor pressure. At the point C on this point here, the gas has completely liquefied. Thereafter, if I try to compress, then only the pressure starts increasing rapidly in the system. Now, the dotted line zone, which is shown in your graph, is what is called saturation zone. In the saturation zone, the liquid and the vapor coexist. Okay? Now, the topmost point is a critical point, which we also mentioned in the earlier one of the earlier tables. Here also you see a table which gives you the gas at its critical temperature and then also it's uh, critical pressure, okay? This is what you are seeing here. For example, oxygen has a critical temperature of 154 Kelvin with at a pressure of 50.1. Or if you look at helium, it has a critical temperature of 5.2 Kelvin at a critical pressure of 2.26 bar. Well, so that means one thing is clear that you have to bring any gas below its critical point so that you can make liquid state. Good. Let's proceed. How does one produce low temperatures? To produce low temperatures, we basically use three different methods. One is called the induced evaporation. Second one is known as isentropic expansion. And the third one is known as isentropic expansion or also known as adiabatic expansion. Let's talk about the induced evaporation. Suppose a liquid is kept on a beaker, let's say, in a room, gradually it evaporates and then goes to the atmosphere. Okay. Actually, if you carefully look at the liquid, the remaining part of the liquid will be slightly cooler. You can actually see, we use water in a mud pot in the summer season. This is because the water in the mud pot gradually oozes out through the pores on the pot and it goes to the atmosphere. The outgoing vapor, water vapor takes away the heat content of the remaining water in the mud pot. So the water in the mud pot is now cooler. Okay. Well, suppose we introduce a process in which we evaporate the liquid very rapidly. Then what happens? If you evaporate the liquid very rapidly, on its surface, then the outgoing vapor molecules will now try to reduce the temperature of the remaining content in your vessel. So this is what is called induced evaporation. So you take a liquid, you rapidly evaporate the liquid, so the remaining part of the liquid starts cooling down and temperature goes down. This is a process which has been used by the earlier people, you know, earlier scientists produce liquefaction. 
In fact, uh, they used what is called a cascade process for the liquefaction. For example, if you want to liquefy nitrogen, you start with ammonia, then use ethylene, then methane, and then you finally produce nitrogen. Okay, how do we do it? We start with ammonia, compress the ammonia, ammonia becomes a liquid because its critical temperature is well above the room temperature. So therefore it will become a liquid. Now rapidly evaporate ammonia. When you rapidly evaporate ammonia, ammonia temperature, liquid ammonia temperature drops down. It will go down below the critical temperature of ethylene because ammonia and ethylene are in two different heat exchangers. Now ethylene is now, if you compress ethylene, because its critical temperature is below now, if you compress, it will become a liquid. So now ethylene can be rapidly evaporated such that you can co cool, make liquid of methane and methane can be rapidly evaporated finally to cool down nitrogen and then by compression of nitrogen, you will be able to produce liquid nitrogen. So this involves several heat exchangers multiple heat exchangers for ammonia, ethylene, ethylene, methane, methane, nitrogen, etc., which should not mix to other. Thermodynamically, one of the very efficient process, but practically very difficult. People in the earlier times could not proceed below 60 Kelvin because they didn't find suitable gases to go below 60 Kelvin. Okay. Now let's look at the Joule-Thomson expansion. What is Joule-Thomson expansion? It's also known as isenthalpic expansion. Cooling of a gas occurs when a high pressure gas expands through a narrow opening or an orifice or a porous material. Okay. So you can see on your uh, right side of the screen, uh, uh, you can see here a diagram in which there is a porous plug onto the left side you have uh, the high pressure gas onto the right side, you have low pressure gas. So the gas molecules are very close to each other here in this left side, on the right side, little far away from each other after passing through this porous material. Okay. You can also use, instead of the porous plug, you can use also a yes, fine orifice, an opening, in small opening can also be used. In this case, there is no external work done by the gas but only an internal work. In other words, the gas molecules try to rearrange and thereby reduce its energy. Okay. Due to the changes in the intermolecular forces, the cooling is taking place. Okay. So in the, in the diagram, as you see, high pressure on the right side, you have low pressure, uh, the short distances between gas molecules, farther distance on the, um, between the molecules on the right side, the high temperature on the left side and the right side is low temperature. Okay. For cooling, the temperature of the gas must be less than the maximum inversion temperature, which is called Ti. Please remember, we also discussed about this in the early one of the earlier tables in the earlier slide. So we talked about what is called the maximum inversion temperature. This is the maximum. If you plot a temperature versus pressure graph, these are all isenthalpic curves, what you see, and the Ti max is here, the maximum inversion temperature. Okay. Now you see the maximum inversion temperature of various gases like carbon dioxide, 1500 Kelvin, oxygen, 893, air, somewhere about 603, and if you see helium, for example, it's about 40 Kelvin. Okay. So we normally work on the lower pressure side that is below these dotted lines because the temperature is high as you go along this curve as you reduce the pressure the temperature also drops so so it is clearly that if i want to apply joule thomson expansion for helium its temperature has to be below 40 kelvin whereas for all the other gases we will be able to make use of joule thomson expansion even at room temperature uh, except hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, is 204. Hydrogen and helium require the cooling, whereas other gases, even at room temperature, a Joule-Thompson expansion will produce cooling. Okay, let's go to the next process. 
Sorry. <coughs> we'll talk about the adiabatic expansion. Or it's also known as isotropic expansion. In this case, the gas is made to perform an external work, say by movement of a piston, or it can rotate a turbine plate. So on your screen, you see a piston cylinder arrangement in which a compressed gas is present. Maybe this is the compressed is the original position of the gas. The gas now expands, pushing the piston out. And therefore, there is a work which is done by the gas on the piston. So now, in this process, the entropy is kept constant. We do not add any external heat to the system, so entropy remains constant. Part of the energy of the gas is now used in doing this external work. If you remember your kinetic theory of gases, you know very well that the energy of the gas is directly proportional to temperature. So if the energy of the gas drops down, it means temperature also will go down. So obviously, there is going to be a decrease in temperature of the expanded gas. Okay, so the gas is now cooled. Okay, unlike the Joule Thomson expansion, there is no set temperature. The adiabatic expansion produces cooling at all times, all temperature levels. Adiabatic expansion will produce cooling. In the second figure on your screen, we have a turbine arrangement. So you have an expansion turbine, okay, the expander wheel and the turbine is now rotating and thereby extracting energy from the gas. The gas gets cooled, outgoing gas is getting cooled. The turbine work is used up to compress a gas on its right side. Okay, now let's proceed. So we have discussed three processes induced evaporation, joule thompson expansion, adiabatic expansion, etc. have been used in our cryogenic plants. The commercial liquefiers make use of one or more of the above cooling methods. Now in this case, the working fluid is made to undergo a thermodynamic cycle and one or more of the above cooling methods is used as a part of the thermodynamic cycle. For example, if you talk about the Linde cycle, it uses just the Joule Thomson expansion and a set of heat exchanges. In a Claude, Claude cycle, you use Joule Thomson expansion as well as adiabatic expansion or isotropic expansion. The Halen cycle also uses the same, but it operates at a slightly higher pressure. The hydrogen plants, they use what is called Stirling cycle. We are not going to discuss that cycle here, okay? but it's a very important cycle. Both liquid nitrogen and liquid helium plants have been prepared by the Stirling cryogenics. Okay, Earlier they were the Phillips, now they are the Stirling people. Now you see on your right side, uh, the two photographs, the topmost photograph, top photograph shows the uh, tonnage plant, cryogenic plant. There are many cryogenic companies in the world, all over the world. Okay, for example, Linde or uh, Air Layer Liquid A, etc. These are the, one of the major companies which produce cryogenic fluids. And Sulzer, etc. And below, you see, this is actually a, a cryogenic plant for laboratory scale sizes. So you have a single cylinder, four cylinder machines, for production of liquid nitrogen. This is marketed by Sterling Cryogenic Speed. Okay. Uh, well, there are many cryogenic companies even in India, Praxair um, or Asiatic gases or Baruka gases, etc. These are people who will be able to give you the cryogenic fluids like liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, etc. Okay. okay, now we will move on to the next topic. How does one produce? much lower temperatures. Well, we have already discussed about this. If we start with the liquid helium, which normally boils at 4.2 K at one atmospheric pressure, you start pumping on helium. When you start pumping on helium, the temperature of helium goes down 
and you cross the temperatures of 2.17 K where the helium becomes a superfluid and further down, okay, in a glass cryostat, you can read temperatures of the order of something like uh, 1.8 or 1.9 Kelvin. On the other hand, in a metal cryostat, because the insulation is much better, you will be able to go to close to about a Kelvin. Okay. okay, still lower temperatures that we are talking, we see, for example, people talk about uh, milli Kelvin, micro Kelvin, and so on. For still lower temperatures, basically there are two methods which have been used, which is called the dilution refrigeration systems or adiabatic demalization. Unfortunately, I will not be able to discuss more in detail on this, except to say a few words on this. For example, a dilution refrigeration in which we dilute the helium-3 isotope in the liquid helium-4, in a helium, uh, liquid helium-4. Okay, in the isotope liquid helium-4. Whereas in an adiabatic demagnetization, it uses paramagnetic salts. You first magnetize the paramagnetic salts, remove the heat that is generated, then suddenly demagnetize, thereby you will be able to produce much lower temperature. There are large number of paramagnetic salts which people have been working with. The figure on your right side, you see a system which shows you, for example, the dilution refrigeration, it's from Oxford Instruments. Okay. In India also, people have been very successful. As far as I know, VECC Kolkata have been able to produce 50 millikelvin through a dilution refrigerator indigenously developed by them. Hats off to them. Okay. Now, how does one store cryogenic fluids? Now, James Thiewar has told us how to take care of the heat transfer by gas conduction. He used as a double-walled vessel with the interspace evacuator. But should also reduce the heat transfer by other mechanisms like conduction, solid conduction, as well as radiation. Okay. So on your right side of the screen, you see a cryogenic storage Thiewar internal structure a cross-sectional view. You see first a cryogenic DVAR has got one inner vessel and then surrounded by an outer vessel. The inner vessel can be of a low thermal conducting material of stainless steel or if it is aluminum, use a, a neck tube which is maybe done of fiberglass, a composite material. Well, the outer vessel will be normally uh, steel or aluminium, depending on what is the product which is marketed by the companies. Now, the interspace of this between the two is totally evacuated. So, we are removing the gas conduction heat transfer by the process. We already use a thin wall neck tubes to increase the length of heat transfer. We can, uh, we can also use thin walled bellows. In this case, in the diagram, what you see, the inner vessel is entirely suspended from the outer vessel. Inner vessel as well as its contents. Okay. We also use large number of insulation layers. The insulation layers are alternate layers of an aluminized mylar and a fiberglass spacer or aluminum foil and fiberglass also can be used. Okay and suitable number of layers of this insulation are put inside and then it is evacuated. Now, a typical cryogenic container of a 30 liter capacity in the international scenario can hold the last drop of liquid nitrogen for a six months period. So that is the present day scenario. Uh, you will also see later on some videos which will show you that liquid nitrogen evaporates so rapidly if it is kept outside in an ambient condition. Okay. Now, when you go to bigger and bigger capacities of containers, you will not be able to use suspension from the neck. They have to be supported inside by suitable suspension arrangements. Okay. So on your right side, the bottom of the screen, you see a cryogenic tank. Okay. 
This is a cryogenic tank which is developed at our institute and our laboratory. It is a liquid oxygen tank. The first we have been using it also for liquid nitrogen. And it has an inner container which is a stainless steel vessel. The inner vessel is connected to the outer vessel by a thin walled bellow. And in this case, you have the same arrangements as you have in the case of a, a small size storage divar. The interspace is evacuated. Then you have large number of multi layer insulations. Okay. And uh, the heat transfer by solid conduction is reduced by the thin wall neck tube, which is the bellow neck tube in this case. It has also additional provisions for removal of the liquid by the side ports. One of the side ports also is called. Okay, later on we'll discuss about this. Now, most of these cryogenic containers cannot be closed permanently because the gas liquid expands almost by about 800 times and because of which one cc of liquid expands to 800 cc of vapor. So if one cc is completely closed to be build up a pressure of almost about 800 bar, so it will become a bomb. Okay, that is actually one of the videos you will see later. And so normally a smaller containers are fitted with a loose fitting cover. Whereas these bigger containers are fitted with suitable safety arrangements. In this case, it is just fitted only with a loose fit cover because we are going to use it only for atmospheric compression. Okay. Now I will move on to another important area called cryocoolers. Well, what is a cryocooler? A cryocooler or a cryo refrigerator is a device which produces the required refrigeration at a specified temperature. It is very similar to that of a refrigerator which we are using at home. In a refrigerator, there is a zone which is available where you keep your food products. You are not worried what is the cooling mechanism, which, cry, which uh, let's say, freon circulates, etc. All those things are not important for us. You require a certain refrigeration at a specific place. Well, exactly same thing can be done also at cryogenic temperatures. Such a system is called a cryo refrigerator, also known as cryocoolers. So here on your right side of the screen, you see one of the cryocoolers. For example, uh, it is from Sumitomo. It is SRDK 415D. 415D. Uh, it produces about 1.5 watts of refrigeration at 4.2 Kelvin. This is the second stage. The zone is the second stage of the cooler and this is the first stage of the cooler. This is at room temperature. <laughs> Helium gas is used as a working fluid in this case. Now this is on the gifford mcmahon cycle. You can also use several other cycles for preparing your crack cooler. You can use, for example, Stirling cycle. You can use pulse tube or you can use tool Thompson systems also for preparing a crack cooler. Uh, the topic of cryocooler is very vast. I will not be able to do full justice to this in this lecture. So what I will present to you will be to show you a few example cryocoolers. There are a lot of uh, developments in this area, particularly because of the space application, cooling of small detectors and so on. So for example, I will present to you a few uh, slides of a few uh, the cryocoolers or cryo refrigerators. Okay, first we'll start with the Joule Thompson refrigerator. You know what is Joule Thompson, the high pressure gas is expanded through a small orifice. So high pressure gas comes in, passes through these small openings. It enters through this, a heat, this is a heat exchanger. At the bottom most of this is, a, it is actually, it's expanded to the Joule Thompson wall. The outgoing gas become cold. The cold gas now returns back through this, the other part of the heat exchanger, and then outgoing gas returns back at room temperature. So in this particular case, you require a source of high pressure gas for production of the cooling. In this case, the Thompson expansion. Okay. Now the right hand side shows you a photograph of a two-stage organ neon refrigerator 
developed by MMR Technologies. Okay. And you can see it's actually uh, the cooling is produced at this particular tip and the gas entries are at these points. These are all special heat exchangers which are used for cooling of these gases. We will move on to the next one. This is a split cooler of sterling type and the big cylinder what you see is a, the compressor part which produces high pressure gas and is expanded through the by sterling cycle in this particular zone. The topmost of this uh, part is actually produces the cooling so the any object to be cooled will be mounted on this. So these are all useful for space applications because you require very small cooling power for a specific uh, region. So you, these are all used for that purpose. This is a linear motor compressor. Uh, here, the compressor is uh, made of a linear motor and this is the compression space and this is the expansion space. So the cooling is produced at the topmost point. This is again a Stirling cooler based on Stirling cycle and there are uh, prop appropriate regenerators are there in this space. Okay. These are all again used for room cooling and so on. Uh, there are many companies who are able to supply this type of uh, crack coolers. The Stirling cooler is extensively used for air liquefaction. Here you see a single cylinder machine uh, based on Stirling cycle and you have a storage. For example, this one liquefies air and then it is stored in this uh, tall vessel and then probably drained out through this bottom outlet. Okay. Now Stirling has also made uh, uh, four cylinder machines. This is a single cylinder what you see on the screen, but they also made four cylinder machines and people have been able to have the uh, uh, liquid nitrogen production by these four cylinder machines. Typically, we will be able to produce roughly about uh, 50 liters per hour by a four cylinder machine. In fact, Stirling has also been able to develop a liquid helium producing machine. I think they are not available in the market. They are outdated at this point. But we had at our institute, we had a liquid helium plant based on the same Stirling cycle. Uh, using a cryostat, we were able to produce liquid and uh, with a last stage of producing a Joule Thompson valve. It used to normally produce about 5 to 10 liters of liquid helium per hour. The cryocooler can also be used to produce liquid helium directly. For example, you can see the SRDK415D, which is a cryocooler based on um, GM cycle uh, marketed by Sumitomo, is mounted in this on the left hand side. It is mounted inside this cryostat, and this is the helium compressor. And you produce the liquid helium collected at the bottom of this uh, cryostat. So small quantities of liquid helium, maybe typically something like 15, 20 liters, 15 liters or 17 liters per day, sort of production of liquid helium is possible using these type of, you know, GM cycle cryocoolers. We have been working on cryocoolers for a long period of time and uh, over the last decades, last two decades, we have been working on cryocoolers and particularly in the pulse tube cryocooler area. I'm not discussing here how, the pulse, how does a pulse tube work, but I have been very IAC has been very successful in the development of a two-stage pulse tube cryocooler. What you see in your screen is a two-stage pulse tube cryocooler. And uh, you can see here the the room temperature and this is the first stage and this part is the second stage. And with this type of uh, cryocooler system, we were able to produce a lowest temperature of somewhere about 2.5 Kelvin. And uh, you can see on the right side of the screen, the typical cool down of the first and second stages. The second stage uh, reaches a temperature of 2.5 Kelvin at its cold head, whereas the first stage reaches nearly about 60 Kelvin or so in one of the configurations which have been tried out. This, uh, this work was supported by the Board of Nuclear Sciences and we are very thankful to them for this. 
Well, I'll move on to a few applications of cryogenics. Uh, a couple of slides uh, I'll put it before we move on to demonstration experiments. Cryogenics has been extremely useful for gas industries. The production of different gases is done by the cryogenic methods. For example, you take uh, use uh, liquid nitrogen or you produce the low temperature and if you reduce the temperature sufficiently low, helium is getting separated compared to all the other gases. So helium itself can be separated or using simple liquid nitrogen. Okay. And likewise, there are uh, different gases can be separated. Uh, we have uh, what is called the distillation of, uh, you know, for example, distillation columns wherein the different cryogenic fluids are separated using the cryogenic method only. Okay. Uh, now we have what is called the pressure swing adsorption systems which are being used for separation of a few gases, for example, nitrogen and oxygen. The current plants use the pressure swing adsorption. Okay. So in the space research, they are used as uh, rocket propellants. We already mentioned about this. Uh, for example, liquid hydrogen is the fuel and uh, liquid oxygen is the oxidizer. A combination of these two, when they are fired, and they, uh, they are able to propel your rocket. And um, so they are uh, used for, a, for in our space applications, ISRO, for example, you talk about a cryogenic engine where you have this liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and they are sent to space at the appropriate point, they are initiated and it is able to carry your uh, <coughs> payloads to farther distance. Okay. Now, the advantage of using hydrogen and oxygen is that uh, it has got a larger, you know, it is able to thrust, higher, higher thrust is able to generate by the cryogenic. It is also used for space simulation. That is, whatever conditions which are there in space can be simulated at room temperature conditions, at the conditions at the, in the ground level laboratory. So for that purpose, liquid hydrogen or liquid helium can be used and you have space simulation chambers wherein your payloads, whatever go in the outer space are tested. In the biology and medicine, you can use it for storage of specimens, and it can be used for cryosurgery, that is freezing a blood or freezing up some components, etc. Okay. For example, there are some surgeries which is possible to carry out on the eye, eye lenses. So you can remove, for example, using a cryo tip, the lens of the eye can be removed, and thereafter the you can replace with an appropriate uh, new lens and so on. Okay. In the food industry, it is used for its storage and also for processing. Cryo grinding is one of the important techniques in the processing. For example, if you take uh, spices, high value spices when they are cooled and then they can be ground at low temperature and kept uh, you know, sealed so that you will have retained the flavor of these materials, of these spices. In the electronics industry, the semiconductor and superconductor electronics, cryogenics have been able to give rise to a better signal to noise ratio. Okay. Uh, the superconductivity we'll be discussing in uh, topic uh, tomorrow. So we will not discuss anything about that. But uh, normally all the space bound devices where you have some detectors and so on, they are cooled down to sufficiently low temperature, maybe liquid helium. Uh, there is a German infrared laboratory, GIRL cryostats, which carry these sort of systems have been tried out. Okay. In the basic research, people use it for high energy physics, okay, for tokamaks, you can also use for chemical process, even simple laboratory scale ex experiments wherein you have to make a solid of a particular chemical compound, etc. Okay. In the cryogenic treatment, I mean, use cryogenic fluids for treatment of uh, material, basically metals, steels, for example, for tool life improvement and metal fabrications. 
it will be useful. Then for power generation, you can use the cryogenic fluids. For example, you can have superconducting generators or superconducting motors, etc., which use the cryogenic fluids. Okay. So like this, there are large number of applications. The cryogenics is an interdisciplinary field which has many number of applications like this. Uh, and uh, I, I think I'm not discussing in great detail any of them here. So I will move on now to demonstration experiments to show you a flavor of the cryogenics. I may have to leave out the screen at this point. I hope it's okay with you. I'll move on to the demonstration experiments. Okay. We'll start with some, uh, start with a simple demonstration experiment. I hope it plays. I'm not sure. Ah, uh, yeah, I think it seems to be playing. Yeah, in this video, I'll make it a little bigger so that you can see it. I'll stop it and move from the beginning. So you have actually a, a beaker kept on a table on which someone is pouring the liquid nitrogen into it. And you can see the liquid rapidly evaporates and converts itself into vapor. And at the end of this, when the liquid is evaporated, you see a white, you know, frost on the surface. This is because of the solid, solid carbon dioxide condensing on it, as well as water vapor. Solid carbon dioxide will sublimate, whereas water vapor will condense on surface. Okay, and gradually drip down. Okay, we'll move on to the next video. This video does not have again a sound. Okay, so kindly bear with me. So here, I'll start from the beginning. Here, the person is trying to do an experiment with uh, showing you the flexibility of rubber. And he is now going to cool down in liquid nitrogen temperature. This is one of the very early videos. I'm very sorry about the quality of the video. I hope you are able to see it. And he takes it out. And then he literally needs a hammer to break it into small, small pieces. What happens is only a physical change. And in this case, the material, uh, after it is broken and then warmed up back, it re regains its original property of rubber. Okay. Different materials, different type of rubbers have a particular temperature called the glass transition temperatures, below which the material is brittle, above which the material is flexible. Okay. Well, this is useful for processing of rubber. For example, there are several polymers which can be ground only at cryogenic temperatures. You cannot grind them at room temperature at all. Okay, because when you try to grind, it gets heated up. We'll move on to the next video. Now, this video has a sound, so I will play it now. Uh, one minute, I have to set up the uh, sound. Please bear with me for a minute. Yeah. I am I'm not sure whether you are... Just hold on for a minute. Yeah. Frostbite Theater presents. I hope you are oh, able guts. to hear the. Oh, baloney. Just science. Hi, I'm Joanna. And I'm Steve. And this is a container of liquid nitrogen. And this is a really big balloon. 
Let's see what happens when we place a balloon in the liquid nitrogen. Okay. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Isn't the balloon going to pop? We'll see. Oh, man. Okay, so the balloon didn't pop. There's obviously a hole in the balloon somewhere because the air is leaking. So maybe instead of popping, maybe the balloon just got really cold and it cracked like an egg, and all the air is slowly leaking out of the way. Well, if that's the case, what's the balloon going to do when I take it out? Nothing. It's a balloon with a hole in it, and all the air is gone. Well, I'd say the air is still in the balloon. So where's the air? Right there. That's water. No. Nope. If that were water, it'd be frozen solid. That's liquid air. What? When we place the balloon in the liquid nitrogen, the air inside the balloon gets really cold. When particles of a gas get cold, they start to slow down and take up less space. If we can get the gas cold enough, we can change it from a gas to a liquid. That's what happened inside the balloon. We changed all the particles of nitrogen and oxygen to a liquid. So how do we get my balloon back? We just have to place it someplace hot, like the table. Oh, so I get it. Now the reverse is happening. The heat from the table is making the liquid air inside boil. When a liquid boils and changes to a gas, the particles move faster. When the particles move faster, they take up more space, and the balloon gets big. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I hope you'll join us again soon for another experiment. Uh, well, in this video, you have seen a balloon is cooled down to low temperature in liquid nitrogen. And because of this, the volume of the uh, balloon decreases. So you know very well, volume is proportional to temperature. Temperature decreases, so volume decreases. Along with that, since it's containing air and it is cooled in liquid nitrogen, it is becoming a liquid. You could see the liquid air that is shown by the in the video. And again, the when you bring it back to room temperature, it converts back into the gas. That's what you have seen. So this is a simple demonstration of your gas law itself by the process. Okay, we'll move on to the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about, we are going to present the resistance variation Greetings, fellow nerds. In this quick video, we're going to lower the electrical resistance of this copper coil by cooling it using liquid nitrogen. Here's a close-up of the coil. As you can see, it consists of many individual turns of copper magnet wire. This took me a couple of weeks to wind by hand, but it was worth it. Now, I've already soldered the ends to my ohmmeter here, and as you can see, the resistance of the coil is around 48.5 ohms. Yeah, my wiring isn't very good, but for God's sakes, I'm a doctor, not an engineer. All right, let's get started. I'll just place the coil in this uh, clear door flask here. And now for the liquid nitrogen. Already, you can see the resistance dropping. This is going to take a while, so I'll time lapse the video. Some materials will actually lose all resistance when cooled far enough. This property is called superconductivity. Copper does not become superconductive, but the drop in resistance is nonetheless quite large. And here we are, from 48.5 ohms, we've dropped down to 6.1 ohms, a drop of almost 87%. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, rate, and comment. In this video, you have seen a copper coil when cooled with liquid nitrogen, initial somewhere about 48.5 ohms resistance, gradually decreases resistance and goes to 6.1 ohm on cooling to 77K. Copper does not become a superconductor. So if you cool further low to down to liquid helium temperatures also, yes, there will be a some finite resistance. Right there. Hello? Yeah. Now, you will be able to see in this video, 
you have seen in this video the resistance variation of copper with respect to temperature. Now, we will show you a next video in which the same phenomenon is shown in a slightly different way. Okay. Here, you have a bulb connected to your coil and then there is a connected to your transformer. There is a, the transformer is energized, but the bulb is not glowing. The bulb is here. Now, what we will do is we will take the bulb, the coil, and then cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperature. Okay, the person is going to cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperature. Once the coil is cooled, then its resistance drops. When the resistance becomes sufficiently low, then it allows more current through the circuit, and therefore you see that the bulb is glowing. Okay, let us do the reverse process. We'll take out the coil to room and allow it to warm it up to room temperature. Okay, now you see the bulb starts dimming down because the intensity goes down because uh, now the uh, resistance in the circuit is increasing. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next video. The next video shows the shrink fitting is one of the important applications in the area of cryogenics. I'll start from the beginning so that you will be able to see it better. Well, the person is having a brass component with a hole. And he's showing the brass component now and an aluminum component, which is a stud. Okay, our approximately clear, nearly the same dimensions. Now he is trying to introduce the stud into the brass part. But at room temperature, it is not going in because the dimension of the stud is slightly bigger than that of the brass part. Okay, now what we will do, we will take the aluminum part and cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperature. So it takes a while for cooling. Okay, we have to wait. Okay, it is cooled now. Now he is able to take it out and then he is now trying to mate with the brass part. Okay, now you see he is able to combine these two and aluminum with the brass. Okay, the piece is kept on the table now. He is allowing it to bring it to back to room temperature, making it warm, trying to separate it out, see whether he can separate. No, it's not possible to separate these two parts. The process of shrinking one component and then fitting with the other is called shrink fitting process. This is useful industrially, uh, shrink fitting of uh, uh, bearings into the housings, etc. Now, this entire thing is at room temperature, uh, just you cannot separate it out. And essentially, this particular thing, if you want to save one component, it is possible. You can put it on a lathe and machine it out by saving one component will be totally machined, the other component will be saved by the process. Okay. Uh, we will move on to the next video. The next video is actually just cooling a flower. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, we'll see the video here. Greetings, daughters. After playing with a lot of liquid hydrogen, many people eventually have the thought to try cooling a drink with it. Of course, most people don't actually try this because they realize a frozen solid drink isn't exactly drinkable. Now, there's another problem for sealed containers of drinks, and that is that ice expands. So eventually, if the can is not pulled out in time, the expanding ice will rupture the can. The leftover unfrozen liquid rushes out, and you get this large mess. At least it's a cool demo on ice expansion. Let me get the can. You can see here where the rupture occurred. Interestingly enough, it's at the side rather than at the tap. Anyway, thanks for watching. So here in this video, a Coca-Cola can is cool, filled with the Coca-Cola is cooled in liquid hydrogen. Uh, and what really happens is the cooling starts from outside to the center. Okay. As the water gets converted to ice, 
you find that the, it requires more space because ice is, uh, you know, water is denser than ice, so ice is having a lesser density, so it requires more volume. So there is a continuous increase in the volume requirement. Okay. Now, we are not able to provide that enough volume for that, so it ruptures the can at the weakest point, which is the sides. Okay, we'll move on to the next experiment. The next experiment refers to Frostbite Theater presents the magnetic Focus. properties. Slow baloney. Just science. Hi, I'm Joanna. And I'm Steve. And this is a test tube of liquid nitrogen. And this is a test tube of liquid oxygen. Let's see what happens when we pour <laughs> the liquids past the poles of a strong magnet. Okay. Now, liquid nitrogen isn't normally magnetic but each of the nitrogen molecules acts like a tiny magnet when it's exposed to a magnetic field. This effect is known as diamagnetism. That's just a fancy way of saying that each of the nitrogen molecules is repelled by the magnet's magnetic field. So when I pour the liquid nitrogen past the magnet's poles, it doesn't look like anything special happens. The nitrogen just falls past the magnet. That's because the diamagnetic effect is very weak so we don't normally observe it. All materials are at least slightly diamagnetic, but because the effect is so tiny, we don't normally notice it. Just like nitrogen, oxygen isn't normally magnetic. And just like nitrogen, each molecule of oxygen behaves like a tiny magnet when it's exposed to a magnet's magnetic field. Oxygen behaves differently than nitrogen, though. The way oxygen behaves is called paramagnetism. That's a fancy way of saying that each molecule of oxygen is attracted to a magnet's magnetic field. So, when I pour the liquid oxygen between the poles of the magnet, it sticks. And we can even make a little bridge out of liquid oxygen that'll stay there until the oxygen finally boils away. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll join us. In this video, you have seen the behavior of magnetic properties of liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is paramagnetic, whereas liquid nitrogen is diamagnetic. So as it passes through the magnet poles, the liquid nitrogen simply passes through, whereas liquid oxygen is able to get attracted and thereby make a bridge. Okay, we'll move on to the next video. In this video, we are going to use uh, freeze a flower in liquid nitrogen. Let me see where, yeah. We, yeah, I'll start from the beginning for a minute. Yeah. The flower, the cells of the flower contain large quantity of water. As it is frozen in liquid nitrogen, it becomes ice. So it is, I will see, you get crumbled because ice can be crumbled over. Sorry, please don't do this for a, you know, normal flowers. This is only for a demonstration purpose. We should not be so criminal to the flowers. Okay, the next video is related to Yeah, we will we'll start with the beginning from the beginning once again, sorry. Okay. Now in this video, sorry, I'm sorry about that. One minute. Kindly just bear with me. Yeah. Not getting that. Okay. The black material, what you see in a thermocol container, is the high temperature superconductor, ytterbium barium copper oxide. Okay. Now this material, the one which is shiny material here is actually the a magnet. Okay, at room temperature, when you try to uh, place this on the top, yeah, it is just showing 
Now we try to place it on the top of this. You see, you can just keep it on the top because there is no superconductivity of that material. The ytterbium barium copper oxide material becomes superconducting with the liquid nitrogen temperature itself. It's critical temperature somewhere beyond 100 and 108, 109 Kelvin. Now you see if you try to place the magnet on the top, the magnet floats. This is the phenomenon of magnetic levitation. Well, what really happens is the material below has become a superconducting material. It has become a perfect diamagnet because of which it has expelled all the magnetic fields that are trying to enter it. So you can see here that you can orient them in different directions. You know, the magnet can be rotated. So the magnetic levitation property can be useful for various applications. Now you see, he is uh, trying to keep the magnet in different orientations. Okay. And ultimately, you will be able to take out the material by the magnet itself and then keep it outside the liquid nitrogen and gradually as the system warms, as the material warms, it loses superconductivity and just tries to sit on the top. Okay, now it is sitting on the top. Okay. Now, the person was able to lift the material using the magnet itself because of the fact it is a type 2 superconductor where the, there is directly also flux lines also will go, also superconductivity also simultaneously exits. So because of this reason, through the magnetic lines of force, he was able to lift it and bring it to the uh, outside the liquid nitrogen. Okay, now this particular video, next one, we'll have a little sound. <laughs> Here, a person is actually closing a bottle with the liquid nitrogen and putting it inside. Now, we will see what really happens. I will try to reduce the sound further. Sorry. So what you have seen here is, if you have a cryogenic container filled with the cryogen and then closed at the top, then it acts like a bomb. So therefore, the, the cryogenic uh, bottle, bottle with the cryogen is actually now bursting. And so it is important when we deal with the cryogenic fluids, the safety norms are completely taken care of. Okay. As I mentioned, Small containers will have loose fitting cover and bigger containers will have safety walls, appropriate safety walls will be placed in the system. Okay. Now we have a last video on the liquid helium. So I will start with this uh, liquid helium thing. Uh, please watch this. There were more surprises ahead. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed at even lower temperatures. This rapidly evaporating liquid helium cools until at two degrees above absolute zero, a dramatic transformation takes place. Suddenly, you see that the bubbling stops and that the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particular is happening. Well, this this is really one of the great phenomenon in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Ordinarily, this container with tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of flow a superflow. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity, 
a thin film can climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. New radical theories were needed to explain them. Uh, in this video, you have seen liquid helium. We start with uh, helium, liquid helium boiling at 4.2 K and start pumping on liquid helium so that the pressure on the surface is reduced. When the pressure reaches somewhere about 50 millibar, then at a temperature, a temperature also gets reduced at a temperature about 2.174 Kelvin, the liquid turns into a superfluid and it's extremely quiet fluid is what you see. The superfluid has some very interesting properties. For example, it has zero viscosity because of which liquid, normal liquid, normal liquid uh, up to uh, of 4 Kelvin will stay, will, will be, will not allow to leak through. Whereas a superfluid will simply leak through a porous container. Whereas also it can make a helium film, superfluid films can be formed because of which you see in one of the, in the, in the video that a small container had a liquid, but because of the film flow, the liquid rises out and then falls back as it drops into the main tank itself. And lastly, it has got extremely high thermal conductivity. Because of this, due to the thermal conductivity, when a heat is applied at any point in the liquid, then the liquid rushes through that, through any of the small openings, so that uh, it will equalize the temperature. And this is phenomenon is known as the fountain effect. And the fountain effect has been useful for cooling up superconducting magnets, etc. Okay. So now I have completed all my uh, presentations. So I would like to thank you for a very patient listening. And I, in fact, I am really thankful to the organizers for arranging this lecture so that many people can be benefited and get a knowledge of the area of cryogenics. Okay, thank you very much. Sir, yes. director sir is joining sir. Thank you, thank you very much. So it was very nice uh, that uh, I could participate in this event. Uh, Low temperature.
Good morning to all. Uh, Professor Sirin Vasan uh, Suri Ranganji, uh, Professor of uh, IIC Bangalore, Dr. Uh, Singla, Dr. O.P. Verma, Dr. Ravi Verma, Dr. Uh, Karan Jain, uh, the, all the participants. Uh, it's my privilege to be here on inaugural of this uh, uh, STC on uh, cryogenics. Uh, and composites, theory and applications. I congratulate uh, Department of Instrumentation and Control for taking uh, such a good initiative, which has been reflected uh, in terms of uh, the participants, used participants, 750 participants uh, in this course. I congratulate the team of Dr. Singla. And uh, uh, as far as uh, NIT Jalandhar is concerned, all of you know this institute came as a regional engineering college, uh, Jalandhar, in 1987. And thereafter, it has been progressing. So initially, we started with three programs, 100 students. Now, institute offer 11 uh, undergraduate UG programs, and uh, the total intake of UG is 1135. Institute is also offering 15 uh, MTech programs, one MBA program, and uh, the intake of uh, MTech programs and MBA is roughly 550. Also, uh, every year we enroll around 100, 124 uh, research scholars for PhD. So this uh, REC was rechristened as the National Institute of Technology, NIT Jalandhar, uh, by an act of parliament in 2007 and uh, has been uh, there. Uh, in uh, mainly in technical education. Some of the latest uh, achievements of the Institute, I would like to congratulate faculty and I'm glad to share that our recent uh, position presented by Pavlon, uh, we are 33rd across the country in Web of Science core collections. So this is uh, an excellent achievement for all faculty, student and staff. And uh, uh, as far as the Course is concerned, uh, the expert is already there. Uh, the uh, cry cryogenics and uh, the composite materials, it has been a uh, latest uh, uh, trend and a lot of research has gone into this. And uh, the expert has given you a uh, lot of uh, inputs into these uh, uh, cryogenics materials. And uh, these material find application uh, mostly in uh, every area, including medical and uh, um, mechanical or space, everywhere you can find uh, the application for such material. So I once again congratulate uh, Dr. Singla and his team. I'm uh, thankful to all the uh, uh, participants. I'm thankful to the experts, uh, Professor uh, uh, Sri uh, Nivas, uh, Sri Nivasanji, and all other experts who will be delivering their lectures during this course. Thank you. Jai Hind. Jai Bharat. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much.
Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. If I am able to answer, I will try to answer some of the queries. I don't know about the time limits, so kindly let me update the report. Uh, actually, I have an expert. Uh, one of the experts is there, uh, Professor uh, Nordic, who will also be making a presentation. Uh, am I audible here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think the deep and shallow treatment refers to the temperature levels at which the cryogenic treatment is done. That's all I understand. Okay, uh, because I am not an expert in this area, uh, Professor Nardig will be able to tell, he is actually making a presentation in this, uh, um, you know, this in your uh, uh, STC, okay. Uh, the hydrogen fuel can be stored normally in uh, actually, in uh, we have got uh, stainless steel containers wherein the hydrogen can also be stored. Okay, uh, but in the space application, they use a special type of polymeric material wherein the hydrogen can be stored. But we don't know much details about all that uh, the way in which the vessels are done. It has a inner thin lining of a metal surrounded by the various uh, layers of super insulation. Now, the thermal penetration depth actually does not directly bring into the cryogenics area. I think it is a different field altogether. Well, thermal penetration depths are seen normally in, um, uh, for example, if you talk about uh, thermoacoustics. Okay, uh, you see, you have your sound waves, which are, for example, is a longitudinal wave. And the longitudinal wave, as it uh, uh, proceeds, there is a compression expansion. And uh, the compression expansion will generally produce a temperature rise and the temperature fall. Okay. Now, the penetration depths will be involved in these uh, things. So, the effect of, for example, the uh, acoustic waves on a material will come into effect depending upon the thermal penetration depth. Okay. If the gap between the two material becomes sufficiently small, then you will be able to see the effects and changes in the temperatures. So, in fact, thermoacoustics is one of the important uh, um, area. Uh, I am not discussing much about that, but I think people can understand this. Okay, the prime number is a parameter which will decide this thermal penetration. There is not only thermal, but there is also a viscous penetration that also is there. The data, I think the this frontal number in the, of a particular gas will now try to talk about this uh, numbers. Thank you. Uh, no, I didn't get the question correctly. Can you repeat again, please? Uh huh. Yeah, there had. Uh, accidents on cryogenics had been there, particularly uh, because um, I think in our lab, when I before I joined our department, we had a liquid hydrogen plant. 
okay uh, it actually had some accident uh, well usually all these uh, accidents happen because of the improper safety arrangements okay uh, if the proper safeties are taken care then the accidents will not happen uh, particularly when you are dealing with the cryogenic fluids uh, you need to use appropriate gloves or masks and other things you could see in the videos which i presented people were wearing the adequate uh, you know safety gears so that is something very essential in many of these um, uh, even you when you handle this cryogenic fluids okay and uh, carbon steels for example is is not supposed to be used for cryogenic temperatures and you will see cracks or vacuum leaks uh, well and one more thing is for example when you uh, talk about uh, let's say a superconducting magnet normally the superconducting magnets are cooled with uh, liquid helium and the liquid helium for example uh, some other superconducting magnets when they apply a, a current they charge it with passing a current through that then the superconducting magnet it can undergo what is called a quench which means there is a sudden change from the superconductivity state to normal state which evaporates almost all the fluid completely so you will have a very large uh, you know uh, release of uh, the helium from that and you will the whole room will become totally cloud i have been able to see a couple of the quenches in our laboratory when we charge some nmr magnets okay thank you Uh, uh, it can be used for freezing <laughs> but it is well known that there are some viruses which can still remain dormant but when you bring them back to room temperature they will become alive okay so i am not very sure how exactly the research will proceed in this uh, direction but it's it's uh, worth trying uh well cryogenics actually deals in a specific range of temperature please I, you might have seen that anything below minus 150 degree centigrade we call it as cryogenics okay refrigeration and cryogenics they are more or less similar only they are different in different ranges uh, as far as the cryogenic temperatures is concerned one has to be a little more concerned in using that right type of material and so on which need to be properly selected for low temperature very low temperature applications okay in fact uh, tomorrow's talk uh, i may be able to present something on uh, composites which are being useful for cryogenic applications okay uh, other than this the procedures or the methodologies are almost similar okay there are not much differences between the two only thing is cryogenics is at much much lower temperatures compared yeah i am thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation which has uh, reached a very large audience i am so happy that uh, many people are benefited out of this short term course which you have order uh, you have organized i in fact thank uh, the members who have been instrumental in doing this and uh, i really thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to to give the very first talk in this area thank you so much and uh, thank you yeah i think i will go off the air now thank you bye